to Tamaki Makoto, Auckland, the city of 1.7 million Kiwis, the city of sales, the city of road cones. Or in other words, temporary traffic management for dreams of a better city. And Auckland, you do dream big. There's nearly light at the end of the tunnel for the Auckland City Rail Link. Just don't ask about the price tag. Council's $2 billion cycleway scheme is ready to launch in an attempt to ease the gridlock traffic. But will Aucklanders actually get on their bikes? Despite being one of the most expensive cities in the world, Auckland is recognised as one of the world's most livable. Despite that, official figures show close to 25,000 people left the city over the past two years for the regions, with house prices among the reasons why. And of course, with more people seeing crime, ram raids, smash and grabs and shootings hitting our headlines every day, there's no solid solution for youth crime here either. So let's meet the people who are promising to flip the script. Uh, that is right, seven after seven now, Auckland mayoral candidates Efeso Collins and Wayne Brown join me in the AM studio this morning. Good morning, gentlemen. Morena. Kia ora. Morena. Good to have you here. Um, I wanted to start off, just give you each, say, 30 seconds, a little pitch to our audience this morning about why they should vote for you. Efeso, you can go first. Oh, I'm really interested in a climate-resilient uh, society. I'm in it for my children and their generation. So we've got to be future-focused, and I believe I provide the collaborative, constructive leadership that Auckland needs today. Mine. Oh, I've got a good track record of fixing big messy organisations in financial trouble which describes the Auckland Council fairly well and here's another one and um, they can rely upon me to um, get on on top of costs and service delivery uh, so that um, Auckland just become proud to be Aucklanders again. Alright so some real differences in the way that you are framing your, your candidacies and I want to get into some of the issues to do with Auckland but I want to start with the debates that have been happening or not happening. If you saw there was a debate Great plan for last week and you didn't turn up. Your opponents are saying you have a problem turning up and fronting up, do you? No, not at all. I've been to 74 candidate meetings, uh, both, and there have been about 36 uh, mayoral debates, and I've done 74 meetings. So I'm turning up, and all of the meetings that I haven't attended have been because of clashes. And I think that's part of the challenge that we have in these debates, is that there are, clash there are multiple debates going on at different yeah. times. But usually, I think it was Wednesday that you let them know that you couldn't make the debate on a Friday. It was a big event that had been organised, 120 people. I mean, if you can't manage your diary... Oh, no, I can manage the diary fine, but I chose that I had to speak to people. David Farris said in his report on the polls that came out in Curia last week that the person who's going to win this is the person who can turn out to the vote. That uh, meeting had 120 people. I spoke to 1,000 people in South Auckland. Now, I've got to make strategic decisions for the campaign, and that's the decision that I made. Wayne, if was talking about polls, who is ahead in this race? Because he has released a poll that <laughs> shows he's ahead, 27% to your 25. Is he winning? No, that was a good effort to try and cover the gaps, but I'm well ahead. And how, do you, how are you so confident of that? We've private polled uh, people who vote, not just everybody, uh, and uh, the taxpayers' union, or ratepayers' union, whichever face was there, did one, and then the, um, the TVNZ poll, they don't do things cheaply or unfairly, and so I'm feeling quite confident about that. Are you a little worried that your popularity has only come about after everyone else left the race? Well, I entered last, and I've slowly worked my way up through the fleet of, as people have understood what it is that I'm doing and the track record that I'm offering. Let's talk about some of the issues. I want to start with transport. If you saw you are promising free public transport, right? Yes. So anyone here in the studio can get on a bus or a train or a ferry for free. That's correct. That's your plan. How much will it cost? $236 million, and we're going to take it from existing budgets that already uh, are at work now for Auckland Transport, and that's a bucket of around $2 billion. So it's just reprioritising those costs and moving that money across. Reprioritising from where? Because you say that much. You say 230 Auckland Transport says... Uh, 100 million per annum now by 2030 could be half a billion dollars a year for this project. And it's a great problem to have because we want more people out of their cars, we're decongesting the roads and they're on the buses and the trains so, so it's going to keep, do really well for okay. our communities. But where's the money going to come from? Because if you look at the council's budget they've got a 90 to 150 million dollar shortfall at the moment, they're deferring projects as it is, mm -hmm. you're wanting to spend more, 
What are you going to cut? Yes, yeah, so these are the things that are coming from the customer experience budget. There's $740 million there. There's the IT budget. There's $350 million there. There's the roading budget, $290 million. So that's just a billion. The other billion I'm talking about is from the consultants that we spend. We give about $4 million per month to groups like, uh, to law groups, but we've already got a legal team inside council. So that's the $2 billion I've identified We will be able to move money across by reprioritising. So, so what IT projects will you cut? Are you going to turn the internet off at the council? No, there are just IT projects that are going to make it better. So, you know, uh, Wayne's talked about transponders. It's going to make little difference for buses. It's going to save you three minutes. Where I'm interested in uh, not only just achieving decongesting our roads by getting people out of their cars and onto the bus and good for climate resilience. So hang on a minute. So but this puts $27 back into people's pockets, which is good for the cost yeah. of living crisis but we're facing we at the moment. But can really clear? So you said around $200 million it's going to cost per annum. Yep. What exactly, what, what programs or... or projects will be cut to pay for that. My job is to identify the buckets and then it's the council's job to say right if that's what's going to be the impetus to get the change so we can shift people out of their cars onto the bus Wayne, what are you we make a collective decision. He agrees oh. completely. Well nothing's free just somebody else pays um, and I, I don't think that's what's going to get people onto the buses. Pensioners get buses free now and they don't particularly catch them more than any other class of people. Um, what will get people onto buses if you speed them up by using the very IT that he doesn't want to spend to uh, brain up our signals network so that the, the lights know the bus is arriving and they'll go green just for a, enough to get the bus through. If you're sitting in the traffic and the bus is now 5k's ahead of you because of that, you might think that it's time to get out of the car. So you're saying speed up the buses, make them faster, make them more user friendly and then people will come. You're saying on the other hand make them free and they'll come. So a, a real difference in approach here. Are you confident that EFESO has costed this properly and that this won't lead to an increase in rates? I mean will we be paying more in rates to cover this? Just about nothing that the council does works out at the cost that they suggest. In fact, things like the City Rail Link, um, they won't even tell us what the cost is. They're so frightened of, fi of us finding out. Uh, and, uh, and if you're going to keep on top of costs, and I've got a good track record of it, like with the $500 million hospital, up on time and on budget, that's because I st we st stood on the cost. I knew them every blooming week. And the, and the board knew them every month. You can't just kind of guess things into the future, particularly with the track record of the costs that the council's got, which is woeful. And the debt too. Fessa, do you know what the debt is at the council? $12 billion for council alone, $16 billion right up through all the family of council. Yeah, so you're not worried about adding to that? Oh, I, I am worried. At the emergency budget, I suggest that we should go to 310% of our debt-to-revenue um, borrowing limits, which is, and remember, we've got... Um, excellent uh, ratings from the Standard & Poor's AA rating, but Council decided on 290 as a um for, for that particular period. We're currently sitting at 256, so I'm satisfied that our debt is within reason. If you look at the debt-to-asset ratio, we're 18% of our debt-to-asset ratio, so we're confident, we should be confident that Auckland Council's been really prudent in its Wayne, approach you're to you're sighing or laughing, I don't know which, but you've missed some kind of reaction to this. The, the debt is perilous. I mean, we're at a time when um, interest rates are rising, uh, to be talking about, and when they, when they get a triple A rating or a double A rating, that's because legally ratepayers have to pay anyhow. It's not a, it's not a, a th pat on the back because we've managed to finance as well. It's the very op opposite to that. And uh, they're talking about debt ceiling. That's like talking about um, counting the life rafts on a boat just after you've hit a rock. Uh, I've run lots of big organisations. We don't get anywhere near thinking about debt ceiling. We're worried about covering our costs. Costs, what the, and, the, and when the 18% of the balance sheet, it's not a balance sheet like a commercial businesses that I've got where the, 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 the assets are assets that you could sell or, or earn money. You can't sell parks and roads and things, they don't earn money. Um, and so um, I'm worried about debt and if you're talking about your kids in the future, and in his case might be his kids, in my case it's probably grandchildren, but I don't really want to load them up with debt either. It doesn't go away, the debt stays. Yeah, it certainly does. Right, let's talk about uh, another issue, big issue, and that's housing intensification, the government's townhouse, so-called townhouse bill. Um, so they've identified, the council has identified some special character areas which they say could be turned into townhouses or, or multi-unit dwellings, that sort of thing, in areas that for some Aucklanders are very special, hence the special character. If you saw... Would you, just a, a very simple uh, approach to this, would you keep the villa or bowl the villa? 
Oh, just um, I, I think I don't think it's that simple. What I do think is the answer to the question is we're going to be 2.4 million people in the next 20 years. We've got to be thinking about how we intensify and provide more housing. So Boulder Villa. So by, what we're going to do is make sure that, you know, heritage is covered under the law, and I think Council's done an excellent assessment in consultation with the community about the grades of which we're going to have the villas and those things that are going to be considered for intensification. I live in an apartment, it's good to close amenity, it's right on the bus line, I don't need the car. That's what we should be okay, doing in so preparing for Auckland. The good balance is about right at the moment, but yes. the government's reportedly going to challenge what the Auckland Council yeah. is doing. Do you vow to fight them tooth and nail to keep what has been established so far? I will fight for what we have agreed to, and we've got a position, okay. and that's the position. So you'll that I fight them fight on this. Yes. All right. What about you, Wayne? I think we've got to beat the government out of Auckland. Actually, their, their job is to send us the money, not tell us how we live in our city. And so, um, uh, the, even things like light rail has been dreamed up down there. Oh, I want to send our 40 MPs back down to Wellington and say, remind them, you're Auckland MPs, not Wellington MPs. We will decide what we're going to do up here. Just send us the money. Right, let's move on and talk about crime. Obviously, this is a major issue for Auckland. And, you know, every night, every morning we come into the studio, we are reporting on another ram raid, another smash and grab. We've got more victims. We've got more um, shop owners sleeping in their shops because they're so fearful and so scared. Do either of you have any good ideas to solve this, Wayne? Oh, I'll crick it off. I'm on the board of the Adahoo Business Association because I've got a building out there. And um, it's not the end aisle, uh, of everything, but um, business associations are funded out of a commercial rate. And um, we spend a third of ours out there on security patrols. And it has made a difference. And uh, day and night they're out there and somebody is watching the camera, CCTVs, because otherwise they're just something that the police look at after the raid. Um, see, that does make a difference and I'd like them to have spent more of that in the CBD because I actually live along K Road anyhow, so I'm close to the CBD. Um, plus, I think the Mayor's got to use a bit of grunt there and tell Wellington, you know, we want not so much more police, but we want them out on the streets, not in the offices. Professor, what's your... I know there are no quick solutions, but is there anything like this idea of more security, beefed up security and paid for through a rate that you have? Yeah, driving a lot of this is disconnection. I've been on your program and on your evening program to talk about this a lot. These are young people who come from pretty challenged backgrounds and we've got to make sure we've got support services so it's working in partnership with the Crown. But we also know that alcohol fuels a lot of this, so maybe Wade might want to decide to close down his dive bar in Otahu where we know that that's the kind of thing that's going to fuel this behaviour. So what we've got to be doing is working better with Thanks police. So. I've suggested that we have more community constables on the ground because we can work with them. They know young people really well and they know the community as well. Do you know what's interesting about what you've just said, Fesso? None of the witnesses that we've spoken to have said that any of these young people are drunk. No, what, it's, what I'm and saying is it's being bars, fueled by, by alcohol, and that's from the research of the DHBs. It's very clear. And we've, if you look at the, the what, alcohol stores... What, raids are being fueled by alcohol? It's being fueled because that's what they're paying for. They are getting those goods. We know this clearly. I've studied youth gangs. I know how they work. What they're doing is they're prepping them up, and then they're providing... Uh, environments for them where there's a lot of alcohol being consumed and right. where they're being trained for youth gangs. That's the reality of it. Wayne, are you going to close your dive bar? No. I think it's a, what's it called? A milestone's one of them. But, um, one of the worst in Otahuhu. Really? Yep. What's so bad about this bar? We have absolutely no crime in our bar. The oh, star you know at the corner is the one, the one that's run by, both by the gang. Bad. They're as bad as so each other. So that's just not true. Um, and uh, these people are doing it at three in the morning. There's nobody in the street. The bar's shut at ten. Yeah. And, um, and they're all young people. They're 13 years old. No one gets served in a bar. And the people that drink in my bar are so older, you close your bar. older working people who come in. Do you, so do you want all bars closed? No, I want his bar closed Why because just it's his? one of the worst. What's it's one so of the bad worst. about it, though? Why does Auckland want a mayoral candidate who's going to be out there representing our communities one? to say, oh, what can we be proud of? Oh, someone who owns a dive bar. That's what a, I have a problem with. A dive with. bar? Yeah, it is. What do you call that it's one? a bar. But, yeah, but why is it a dive bar? bar? What's so bad because about it? Because we know people stumble out of that place drunk oh, and they've got to be picked up. You want transponders on the bus because you're but right on the people stumble out of every bar drunk. That's the point of a bar, isn't it? That's the point of what it's doing in South Auckland. And what we know in South Auckland is it's it's bars like these that are causing huge issues for us. These are the social issues we're dealing with daily. Wayne, this is quite... <laughs> this is a sudden attack from nowhere. Um, what, the uh, fact that you own on, a dive on, bar? Uh, but on Ponsonby night, on, after the rugby, you know, I walked down Ponsonby Road to John Kerwin's party and um, there was people 150 metres long waiting to get into the bars all the way down there. 
and they, they were there late. Mine's not a, ours is a, a working men's pub. Most of the people come in there during the day after they've finished their shift, actually. It's not a late night pub at all, and he clearly hasn't been there. Oh, I've um, been outside it's, on so, the bus, I've been watching. All right. OK, we have to leave it there. Um, sort of a weird end to the debate. <laughs> that's a bit odd. That's, that's where it ends.